Hello, everyone. Okay, so first of all, welcome to the fifth edition of the Digital Rights and Disturbance series, uh, the spring session we are starting uh, today. And so it's with great, great pleasure that I introduce the lecture of today. Uh, let me say that I strive to have our host in presence uh, because we are used to that uh, before the pandemic. So it's really great that we have a host in presence. We can again go back to uh, a little bit of uh, uh, education in, uh, in presence here at the on campus. And today we have the first of three events uh, that have been scheduled for the lecture series. Uh, the lecture will be all posted on Zoom. Uh, we are going to host the panel on NFTs and uh, uh, blockchain culture on the on Tuesday, the 10th of March, and then a lecture on algorithmic solidarity on Wednesday, the 16th of March. Okay, so please let me thank the communication department for supporting again the organization of the lecture series. Uh, and I'd like also to thank Zaria that is helping us for the organization and coordination of the events. Okay, so I have the great pleasure to introduce Valentina Ranni, um, who is an art historian, a curator, a teacher. And Valentina undertakes research on the relationship between arts and technology. Uh, she has a particular focus on internet culture. As we are going to see from the lecture today on memes. Uh, she's an adjunct professor that teaches at uh, Polite uh, Polytechnic University of Milan uh, and also teaches digital culture at San uh, here in Rome. And she's also the author of very interesting books, uh, Random, that is dated 2011, and uh, The Aesthetics, which are for me. Oh, it will be out in English in the fall. We'll I can announce out. it. Yeah. Okay, we have this event that will be out in English in the fall for, for all means fans. The <laughs> book will be out uh, in the fall. Uh, so, as, as I was telling you this evening, she's going to uh, lecture on, uh, on the aesthetic of memes. So, please uh, uh, join me uh, in welcoming her with an applause so we can enjoy the talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just turn the screen just a little bit yeah. to see the slide? Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, good evening. And uh, thanks so much for this invitation. I am very happy and honored to be here. And uh, so, uh, as Alberto said, I am a contemporary art historian uh, with a huge passion for uh, internet culture. I have been studying this relationship between art and technology, and especially between art and uh, internet, art and the internet for almost uh, two decades now, uh, as a, mostly as a, an independent researcher, uh, as a curator and as a lecturer. Uh, today, I am going to talk about uh, digital images, memes, and uh, more generally, uh, online content circulation. Uh, some of the ideas I'm going to share with you uh, come from the book that Alberto mentioned, that is titled Meme Estetica, in Settembre Eterno dell'Arte. Uh, and that was published in Italian in uh, 2020. And also this uh, uh, presentation contains uh, a preview um, of the contents of a new article that uh, uh, will be out in March in a publication uh, called Futures Photography. That it's, uh, it's a publication by a photography platform based in the Netherlands. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about uh, technology uh, and society, technology and change, because um, as we all know, when a new technology uh, makes its way into the world, a mutation process is uh, set in motion. 
Some of the changes are immediately visible, uh, but others happen on a, a deeper level, and sometimes they become clear for us to see only many years later. In the case of digital computers, uh, the thing what, that was clear from the start uh, was uh, the incredible capacity that computers have to calculate and to manage data. Uh, but instead, we had to wait uh, at least until the 1980s with the arrival of digital cameras and personal computers uh, to understand, to get a, um, a first glimpse of the impact that computers and networks would have on the world of images. So not generally on the uh, management of data, but on the world of images in particular. And as a consequence, also the impact that these uh, would have on our perception uh, of the world. Uh, I don't know. Is that working? Is it me? <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, if you Okay, if you give me the keyboard I can use that. Or the mouse. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. So, um so as I said, the impact of computers on the world of images was not clear from the start. Um, but nonetheless, even before the uh, advent of computers, a few visionary thinkers managed to uh, gift us with some spoilers about our future. Uh, for example, the French poet uh, and philosopher Paul Valéry that you see here, uh, in his famous essay from 1928, The Conquest of Ubiquity, described a future where visual and auditory content would be delivered in every home, just like water and gas. And just by observing the changes that were being introduced in the society of his time, uh, like electricity, photography, and sound recording, uh, he was able to forecast in an impressive way the future evolution of media delivery that we experience today. Uh, in, the, in the same text, um, he also addressed some uh, futuristic notions like, for example, the idea of producing uh, dematerialized content. And so keep in mind that it's 1928. Uh, and also the idea of being able to transmit this kind of content over a network. That was also a very visionary uh, idea for the time. Uh, but now, oh, sorry. But now, coming back to the present, uh, we can say that one of the most, uh, uh, I mean, without question, one of the most important effects that digital technology has had on photography is the exponential growth of image circulation. Uh, photographs today manifest themselves on a wide range of different devices. We uh, see photographs on different devices, but we, and we can also we also produce photographic images using uh, different objects. We don't just use a camera; we use computers, tablets, smartphones, also surveillance systems and drones. Uh, cameras are like embedded in a lot of different objects uh, and, and are sometimes hidden like everywhere. So. We can say that today photography can no longer be identified with a single object and nor with a single action. Uh, it has become multiform and ubiquitous as uh, Paul Valéry uh, predicted and images are produced in a continuous streams, not only by people, but also by machines. Uh, and, 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 it, and they form, um, they end up forming a constantly updated database, uh, um, a sort of visual library that expands 
that is ever expanding. And, and, and this uh, library expands in a very chaotic way. It is not organized. And so any um, attempt to catalog and organize this kind of material is impossible. Um, another important thing that I think, I think uh, we can um, highlight here is that the very act of seeing uh, triggers a series of behavior that like starts uh, automatically as, as a reflex, as a conditioned reflex. Uh, the act of seeing includes the act of showing and then the act of sharing. I see something, I photograph something and then I share this image with the world. But, but the sequence sometimes does not end there because when we share the image, the image become part of a conversation. Uh, and it stimulates the production and the exchange of other messages, other images uh, in, in, in a potentially infinite process with unpredictable results. Here in this image, you can see an installation that was made in uh, 2012 by a Dutch artist and curator named Eric Kessels. And the title of this installation is 24 hours in photos. And in order to give uh, people uh, a concrete, uh, uh, somehow tangible demonstration of this visual abundance in which we live, that sometimes can be hard to grasp because we, because we mainly uh, deal with images on screens and we use remote storing systems to store them and to exchange these images. And so in order to give people some sort of uh, tangible sensation about uh, this, he decided to print all the images uploaded on Flickr, so on a photo sharing site in a single day. And the result, as you can see, is uh, like an avalanche of paper that fills uh, different rooms from floor to the ceiling. But this was 10 years ago. And, and the photos you see here were collected on a single website. Uh, today, it is estimated that we share online daily something like 3.2 billion images. So it's much more that, I mean, that what these images can suggest. The most uh, striking and probably also the most uh, well-known example of the ubiquity of photography in our life, in our time, is of course Google Street View. But another giant image producer that sometimes we, we, we overlook is the Global Video Surveillance Network, which is a system that is composed of millions of cameras that are scattered in every corner of the world. And, and many of these devices are connected to a network and a percentage of, of, of them can also be accessed online and, and, and the contents can be experienced online. In most cases, we see online cameras that, that, that capture public spaces like streets and squares, uh, but there are also thousands of cameras that are pointed on private spaces and that, and that uh, sometimes are also uh, accidentally open. And so we online, we, we can encounter also a lot of images that are shared unknowingly by people through these kind of technologies. So the first two effects of, uh, the, of the digital, of the advent of digital technology uh, on photography are uh, dissemination. So this immense uh, uh, circulation, dissemination of images. And the second effect is the extreme visibility of the world. We see much more uh, of the world right now, thanks to the use of these uh, uh, kind of technologies. But the fact that images are, digital images are made of code uh, has also transformed photographs into objects that can be very easily modified. This is the third important thing. So dissemination of visibility and manipulation of images. And, and this, leads us to the main topic of this lecture, uh, which, are, which is about the consequences 
of image manipulation. Uh, in fact, the, uh, this kind of killer combination between easy manipulation that is made possible by uh, simple and cheap editing software uh, and instant dissemination that is made possible by the spread of internet connections. The killer combination between these two things, easy manipulation, instant dissemination, generated a whole new visual ecosystem. Um, and this ecosystem is like inhabited by images that seems to like act and replicate a little bit like living organisms. I images uh, are today can be seen as entities that evolve, they mutate, they change over time. And in, 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 the, in the book, in the aesthetic books, I call this new kind of image, the unstable image, because it, it's an image that is never fixed and, and it, it continues to change over time. Um, in this new visual system, so nothing is still, everything is subjected to change, and digital files, whatever the, their content might be, uh, are always um, exposed to the possibility of being downloaded, modified, and re-uploaded on the network. And during their life, their journey on the internet, images can change location multiple times, they can disappear, but most importantly, they can be manipulated in infinite ways with different purposes by, by a wide range of different people. Um, sometimes the modifications are barely visible, but other times they are so radical that they end up like transfiguring the initial content and generating a whole new one. Of course, as you surely know, image manipulation is not new. It's not something that uh, arrived with the uh, advent of digital technology. Uh, image manipulation is not new in the history of photography. It uh, having existed in, in various forms since the, the days of the daguerreotype, so uh, from the beginning. So things like coloring, uh, retouching, and merging of different images and other kinds of special effects have been common since the mid 19th century uh, and have only increased with the advent of more uh, advanced and more usable uh, tools. But another interesting thing uh, to notice is the fact that this kind of, uh, this older kind of uh, image manipulation doesn't only, uh, didn't, sorry, didn't only take the form of the political photo montage. This is a very famous example uh, of that kind of manipulation. So an image that has been retouched uh, to change uh, the perception of history and, on, and, and to create a false event in time. Uh, this is the, the most, uh, as I said, uh, well-known genre of photo manipulation uh, in the photo, in the pre-Photoshop era. But there is another kind of uh, image manipulation, uh, another genre that it's uh, normally generally called trick photography, that was extremely popular between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, not only among professional photographers, but also as a hobby in, 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 the, in the world of amateur photographers. For example, in a very famous book by an artist and theorist named Laszlo Molinage, the book is titled Painting, Photography and Film. It was published in 1925. And in this book, for example, there are several examples of this type of photo manipulation that, uh, as you can see from the images, is not uh, I mean, the, the, the goal of this kind of manipulation is not to uh, create a false reality, it's not to deceive people, but it's to create an alternative reality, something that it's not possible in, uh, in, the, in, the, normal, uh, in the real world, in the, in the normal order of things. Um, for example, here you can see uh, the image of this very long um, horse, uh, that uh, is uh, titled The Horse That Never Ends or The Man With All These Eyes that is called The Tree of Eyes. Um, in this book, Laszlo Molinage, uh, who, who by the way, he, 
he always um, advocated for a free and flexible use of photography. And he's, in, this, in the book, he says that photography can be uh, um, a tool to vehicle utopia and humor and shows this picture as an example of a surrealist and also comic use of the photographic image and on, uh, of the, especially of the photographic uh, image uh, of the photographic manipulation. Today in the 19, in, in the, sorry, in the past, in the 19th century, image manipulation, as I said, was a niche hobby. It was something that was for a few people that were really into that kind of activity. But today, thanks to smartphones, apps, and personal computers, this kind of activity, so image manipulation, it is a mass phenomenon. It is something that we all do, almost all of us do, in a way or another. Uh, it can be a very simple and basic way to do it, just using, I don't know, an Instagram filter, that is image manipulation. Oh, oh, of course, it can be a very, a much more uh, difficult and complex uh, uh, act of uh, manipulation of an image. But it's, uh, I mean, this idea of taking an image and modify it in, in a very spontaneous way, something that we do daily. These are other examples that are very much related to this idea of trick photography, of uh, uh, twisting uh, the, the, the shape of things and twisting the form and the content of images in order to uh, stimulate humor and stimulate uh, imagination and also connect to very uh, uh, distant ways uh, of seeing the world, like distorted ways and alternative ways of seeing and, and, and interpreting the world. Um, this is a very famous case of image manipulation. And according to uh, photography scholar, Fred Richtin, this is the beginning, this marks the beginning of the digital era in photography. Uh, this is uh, when the National Geographic magazine's editor decided to um, change a photo, to alter a photo that was originally horizontal, as you can see in the picture, and they manipulated the original image to fit the vertical format of the cover. But in order to do that, they had to like uh, shift the two pyramids in order to make them closer. So it was an actual manipulation of uh, reality because the pyramids are not so close as you can see, uh, as you can see them in this picture. So this seemingly innocent modification of opened up a giant discussion that is still open today around the very nature of photography in the digital age, especially in relation to the concept of truth and, on the, and in relation to the concept of documentation. And this is another uh, case, very famous case of image manipulation that is more recent. This is 2008. And this is, um, missile test that was made in Iran that went partially wrong because one of the missiles didn't work. And, but the government decided to release a doctor uh, manipulated, a re retouched version of, uh, of the image. So with a Photoshop extra missile that was just copied and pasted. So they just copied a missile and pasted it uh, where in, in the place where the missile was missing. And, uh, but before the manipulation was noticed by the general public and by other journalists, the photo had already appeared on the front pages of uh, several newspapers and websites all, all around the world. But the big difference between 1982, so here, and 2008, is that in 1982, almost nobody knew how to use an image editing software. And the World Wide Web didn't exist yet, and social media didn't exist yet, and smartphones weren't around. And so in 2008, this failed Photoshop image triggered thousands of memes, remakes, remixes, alternative version, like a swarm of covers and alternative possible, all the, all the alternative possible image you can think of. 
sorry. <laughs> um, so the arrival of code into the world of photography of the digital code, uh, as you, uh, as we can understand, uh, as given birth to a new kind of image, a totally new kind of image. And this, kind, this image uh, in a book from 2015 that is titled Soft Image Towards a New Theory of the Digital Image, uh, Ingrid Olsel and Remy Marie called it a soft image. And they write, what was supposed to be a solid representation of a solid world based on the sound principle of geometric projection, our operational mode for centuries, a hard image, as it were, is revealed to be something totally different, ubiquitous, infinitely adaptable and adaptive, and something intrinsically merged with software, a soft image. And finally, what makes the situation even more messy and complex is the arrival of artificial intelligence in the world of digital photography. Uh, so the advances of uh, a technology called computational photography, which is a technological field that experiments with replacing optical processes with computational dynamics. And thanks to this kind of technologies, images, uh, sometimes do not need to reach the post-production stage to be, to be considered manipulated, to be considered post-produced. Because artificial intelligence softwares sometimes make decisions for us before we know it. In the exact moment we press the button on our smartphone, the software always, already took some decisions for us. So the image is kind of born already manipulated in some way. And uh, machine learning algorithms are able to generate photographs that reproduce places and people and situations that have never existed in the first place. For example, here you can see these faces. They come from a website that is called This Person Does Not Exist. And they are all images produced by uh, an AI algorithm. Finally, uh, another instability factor for the digital image resides in the metadata. Uh, in fact, each file uh, can be, each digital file, a digital image can be uh, enriched with some additional code that carries information. And this information uh, tells us uh, about uh, the origin of the image, the date, the author, and other technical specifications, and sometimes also information about the content. And metadata, which is uh, uh, mostly generated by cameras, but can be also be added later manually, uh, can be also manipulated, can be also changed. And even a small change in the structure of the metadata determines a redefinition of the content of the context, sorry, uh, to which a, 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 an image refers. And also it can uh, influence the future of, of the circulation of that particular image and its degree of the visibility. This is a very, uh, this quote is taken by a very interesting paper uh, that was published in 2013 by Daniel Rubinstein and Katrina Lewis is called Nodes on the Margins of Metadata. And it talks exactly the, uh, about this, about the fact that photography, they say, is this kind of unstable surface that produces meaning not through indexicality or representation, but through the aggregation and topologies of data. So the digital image is not only an image, but it's also a packet of information. And so we, we, another uh, thing that makes the image unstable is the manipulation of that kind of information that accompanies the image. Um, excuse me, just a second.
So this um, instability of digital images is particularly visible in internet memes. I won't explain what a meme is. I assume that you all know in a way or another what I'm talking about. But uh, so this mutability of digital images is very visible in the world of memes because it's a, a type of content that seems to like to be like the perfect embodiment of this mutation process that the images uh, undergo day by day. And in the context of memetics, every image is a potential template for the meme. And every piece of content is uh, eligible for use, no matter the source, the style, the medium, and the original meaning. And the consequence of these unregulated and um, infinite remix process is that nowadays, every day online, we encounter images that bring together things that should have never found themselves on the same page. I usually say that these kind of images shouldn't even exist. For example, this one. You can see there is a Van Gogh mixed with the Hide the Pain Arrow, which is a very famous meme character. Or this happens, so the Nyan Cat with Louis Bunuel. Or sometimes even crazier thing can, things can happen, like this one. Like what's happening here? We can see Mark Zuckerberg like doing jogging in Vietnam. This is also disturbing. But this is a very representative example of what happened, what can happen when this remix process is totally uh, anarchic and unregulated. Everything can be used and everything can meet everything else. And this, uh, and in order to uh, comment on this attitude, it is very useful to borrow the words, some words that were written in 1956 by Guy Debord and Gilles Goldman in a very famous text called A User's Guide to Detourman. So we are in the context of situationism and borrowing the words written by them, uh, we can say that the mere act, the mere act of meme making implies indifference toward a meaningless and forgotten original. So not only they say that any elements, no matter where they are taken from, can serve in making new combination. You see at the beginning, any elements, no matter where they are taken from, can serve in making new combinations. So anything can be used. Uh, when two objects are brought together, no matter how far apart the original context may be, a relationship is always formed. And then they also say that uh, um, it is therefore necessary to conceive of a parodic serial stage where the accumulation of the tuned elements far from aiming to arouse indignation or laughter by alluding to some original work, will express our indifference toward the meaningless and forgotten original. So in, in, in the world of memes, the original content, some, most of the time is irrelevant. Uh, so the key word here is indifference. Uh, every piece of our visual I mean, library is a potential piece of the final uh, image, mm -hmm. potential piece of the final puzzle. So nothing is untouchable. Everything is transformable and the ways of mesh up are infinite. And what we can say related to our contemporary moment is that this uh, anarchic attitude towards the use of images that it's so well described by this uh, text from the 50s is now very um, widespread in the new generations. Uh, it's typical of a generation, maybe two generations uh, by now, that uh, tends to attach less importance to authorship, uh, sometimes also to intellectual property itself, and a generation that is uh, accustomed to uh, the frenetic consumption of content and accustomed to the practice of file sharing. What is particularly interesting, uh, if we specifically 
think about digital photography uh, is the fact that in a similar cultural environment, when a photograph enters the public sphere, and so, and therefore is seen and used by millions of people around the world, it immediately ceases to exist as a single entity. It is not a photograph. It is not a single photograph anymore. It morphs into a vast network of variations, of versions. It turns into a galaxy of possible versions of itself, um, a swarm of covers and remixes that ends up becoming the true nature of the image itself. We can say that the photograph ceases to be a single image. And uh, um, the cultural significance of the image uh, and all its possible interpretations and the aesthetics and the meanings, all these things are tied up to the entire cluster of images. And we cannot possibly see that image as a unique and, and stable object. Uh, and this uh, mechanism applies to every uh, image uh, that reaches a certain peak of popularity, uh, regardless of the, 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 proven the provenance and the cultural status. It, happened to, it happens to very famous works of art, and it happens to the peak of Bernie Sanders in Mittens, and it happens to Baby Yoda, but it can also happen to everyday peaks, peaks um, took by normal people around the world, not famous images, not images that are uh, <clears throat> that appear in the press. And uh, peaks that they that accidentally become worldwide icons. And I would like to end this presentation with this specific case, uh, the case of a meme template that is known uh, on the internet as the disaster bureau. This is the original image, the, the, the image template of the meme uh, cluster. And uh, <clears throat> the original image is, uh, has been shot by uh, a man named Dave Roth in January 2000 and 2005 uh, in, uh, in the United States, in North Carolina. Uh, and the image shows a little girl, uh, his daughter Zoe, and she is smiling devilishly in front of a burning house, as you can see. Uh, the peak was first uploaded on the internet in January 2007, but it began to gain attention only at the end of the year when Dave Roth uh, decided to submit the image to uh, a magazine for a competition, so releasing the image into the world. Over the years, the disaster girl photo sparked thousands, maybe more than thousands, of uh, derivative versions. Uh, this picture resonated with a lot of people that use the image to communicate different feelings and different ideas. Um, Zoe's face has become uh, a piece of language, like a, a sign, an icon that is recognized worldwide. And it's used to communicate ideas, tell jokes, express emotions, sometimes disseminate political statements even. Um, the original photograph has been retouched, uh, disassembled, just opposed with other kind of images and other texts, text, sorry. It has been reproduced in paintings, drawings, and videos. After 16 years from the moment in which the camera button was pressed for the first time, this image is not a photography anymore. It's not a photograph, sorry. It's not a photograph anymore. It's, it's a, a vast and tentacular cultural object. The singular image has mutated into a visual galaxy that keeps expanding and keeps producing meaning. And the existence of this kind of um, dispersed and, and collaborative kind of uh, uh, digital photography, a kind of content, Immediately, if you think about it, raises a question, what happens to the concept of authorship? Or to be more exact, what happens to what uh, Michel Foucault called the author function? 
In the case of the disaster girl, uh, even if we know the name of the person who took, who took the pig, uh, this information isn't relevant in any way. It does not add value to the image culturally nor economically, and it doesn't help us understand the possible meanings behind the image. In this case, the author simply doesn't function as one. It doesn't function as it used to function in the past. And the information about authorship re-enters the scene only when these kind of cultural artifacts are sold on the market, because you have to like decide whose bank account is going to collect the money at the end of the sale. This has become very clear uh, when the disaster girl together with other very famous memes like uh, uh, Success Key, the Nyan Cat, was sold as an NFT at, at, the, at the beginning of, of, uh, of last year for a very large sum of money. Uh, it was like half a million dollar according to the press. But when it comes to memes, the question of authorship is really complex because they can never be considered, as I said, like a single unit of content with a single author. The cultural value of memes is never produced by the single image itself. It's produced by the collective participation that is built around it. Here is um, a quote by uh, an article by Silvia Daldosso. She is a member of uh, an art collective uh, named Cluster Duck. They are a, a collective that studies memes and that produces uh, projects and research projects and artworks on the theme of memes. And he wrote in this article, memes exist in a given period for, uh, for a given historical reason, sometimes political, often subcultural, as their major significance is happening on ephemeral media, such as chats, threads, and comments in private groups. For this reason, a meme should not be considered an autonomous unit of information that propagates on the net following a spatial and viral diffusion model. And consequently, it should not be sold as such. And I'm going uh, to the conclusion. And I would like to say that, uh, first of all, that uh, um, so we as a society, we shape our technological tools, as you know. But at the same time, technological tools, when they, especially when they arrive in the hands of people, in the hands of uh, the majority of people, they tend also, they tend to shape the way we see the world and they tend to shape the language that we use in very profound ways. So the question is, um, what does living in the age of memes implies? In which way the memetic logic influences our minds, our visual habits and our cultural system? So answering to these questions constitutes a challenge that many researchers, artists and philosophers are facing now, right now, because we are only beginning to scratch the surface of such a complex and, and, and ever-changing phenomenon. As I try to explain in, in the course of this lecture, images have become malleable. They evolve in space and time like live entities. And we know that we have the power to change them and we do it all the time. We do it in our minds first when we see images and then we do it on our screens. And, we, and by doing that, we collectively reshape our visual heritage at each click. This is an immensely, immensely powerful and creative act if, you, act if you think about it. This is, this is something that is really powerful and really creative. But it, but it, but it, it, it has also um, a dangerous side because we perceive reality through our screen nowadays. We perceive most of the reality around us through the, uh, the screen. And so literally every manipulation of content matters, even the smallest manipulation has effects. It has effects on our beliefs and therefore on our behaviors. And having infinite versions of the images that surrounds us means having access to imagination, to art, to choice, uh, to humor, and to a lot of wonderful things. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it can um, give birth to a sort of collective way to make art and to produce contact, and this is wonderful. 
But at the same time, we are uh, constantly exposed to the risk of not being able to tell facts from fiction, to be deceived by manipulation, to end up getting trapped in a kaleidoscopic hole of mirrors. I would like to end, this is the last uh, slide, I would like to end with a quote from an American media scholar whose writings are still incredibly relevant several decades uh, after their first publication. His name is Neil Postman, and uh, he made a famous statement in 1998 during a conference in Denver. And you can find the, the, the text of the conference online. Uh, it's called Five Things We Need to Know About Technological Change. It is a, a, a small but very dense text, and I suggest that you look for it if you haven't read it yet. And uh, during this uh, um, conference, he listed what he thought to be the five fundamental features of technological change. And the third feature on the list was about the fact that uh, every technology makes people use their minds and bodies in different ways, uh, influencing the way they codify the world. And, and I quote here, he said, perhaps you are familiar with the old adage that says, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We may extend that reason. To a person with a pencil, everything looks like a sentence. To a person with a TV camera, everything looks like an image. To a person with a computer, everything looks like data. That was 1998. So maybe today, to a person with a smartphone, everything looks like a meme. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really interesting uh, for our lecture. Okay, so we can have a little bit of conversation question now. So we have a for uh, comment and questions. Okay, maybe I'll be icebreaker. So start maybe discuss this explore more. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to start with the this, this kind of uh, conclusion that you offered us uh, on imagination of the partner, because it's really kind of interesting in knowing the perspective of what our experience uh, uh, Because my own feeling is really uh, there is this kind of lack, uh, but more than a lack of imagination, more like uh, a capture, uh, a kind of driving and addressing of that imagination. Uh, and this is connected to what you were saying. Uh, uh, we should at the beginning of your mentioning the uh, surveillance cameras. Uh, uh, we are mostly aware that the cameras do not uh, watch anymore. They refute extract data uh, in order, for example, to probably address uh, social spaces. Uh, and this, this can uh, again be connected to the disaster girl uh, you were talking about, because in some way that kind of image, as you were saying, really began uh, very powerful as a meme, it was widespread and uh, not really simple, like, uh, but uh, I don't very viral. And probably the, the image really tell us that there, is some, there are some unconscious processes at play, some uh, probably brain individual and translating the image production. So that's my question or comment. Uh, if you can maybe again expand a little bit on these ideas, because my feelings are the imagination in some way, uh, let's say, address it and pilot that. Uh, and sorry? Pilot that uh, uh -huh. uh, controlled by a kind of data extraction technology that we have uh, uh, with computers. So it also be this kind of uh, uh, lack uh, or again the trust of collective imagination, especially of the mathematical very uh, especially sorry the mathematical very yeah. sort of liberating uh imaginary for for that moment, especially in the I uh, yeah, I actually feel that there is a lot of imagination going on, actually. <laughs> and but some of it, as you said, some of it is uh, uh, not visible. Some remains maybe on 
a hidden level like underground that it's not immediately perceptible by us. But I think that there is a lot of, ima of imagination going on and, and, and maybe it, um, the difficult thing now is to move through this uh, incredibly chaotic world of images and opinions and versions and the personalities. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, everyone is trying to is maybe it's giving a contribution to this scenario, and so the difficult thing is to understand and and perceive and and try to make some sense out of it. So maybe I, I think that there is a lot of imagination, and I also think that the internet brings up uh, a lot of uh, it, it's it's a sort of um, deposit of our our. Uh, less conscious feelings and ideas. I think that that on the internet, sometimes people uh, kind of find a way to express feelings and ideas and sensations that do not normally uh, come up during normal life. I mean, AFK, so uh, away from keyboard. And sometimes the internet, turns into a space where people still feel a little bit free in a sense. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, personal expression, I'm not talking about freedom in all the different, <laughs> in all the other senses, because as we all know, the internet is not, uh, it cannot be considered, I mean, we cannot have a, a, such a naive uh, attitude to it to consider it a free place. But in terms of imagination and creativity and self-expression, I think that it is. And I think that memes are a big, um, are, are one of the places when, you, when we can see a lot of imagination happening and a lot of uh, uh, ideas and feelings that people are trying to express. The thing that you were saying about the image of the disaster girl is true. Some images go viral for a reason because they kind of embody a feeling, a sensation. They are, I mean, they resonate with people for, for a reason that we can understand. And this, um, I mean, the disaster girl is probably the most popular image of that kind, but there are a lot of memes that are based on, the, on a similar template of a person that is standing behind the fire or in front of a fire or uh, maybe doing something else. There is the, the, the famous meme with the, the dog with the office on fire, he says, it's fine. Huh? And that particular meme, for example, has been used a lot to comment on uh, uh, global warming, for example, to people use it to express their sensation of living in a world where they feel continuously uh, threatened by the, some sort of impending doom. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Okay, so if there's a lot of experience on that question first, I think of a lesson so we can uh, think about what the words even say. I think that that's uh, something in the chat maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, was interesting where he said that the, um, the original will no longer be relevant. I'm not sure if I'm getting the words exactly, but the, the, the original will get uh, obliterated or eliminated. Sorry, can, can I get closer? Because I am. Yeah, if you want, I can stand up. No, 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 I can, I can get closer. Okay, the, um, the, the, the quote from Guy DeVore about the original is going to get obliterated or yeah. maybe irrelevant. So I have a, I have a genuine question because. I thought that the way memes work is that it's, it's the meme is in reference to the original. So you have to have an awareness of the original for the memes to make sense. So in that sense, it revives the original or it becomes part of the background. So that's the first part of the question. And the second part is, because I'm only asking this because I know a lot of students ask me this and who are interested about NFTs. And you know, they they've read uh enemy. Uh, the mechanical reproduction article, and they want to know if the NFTs are bringing back the aura of the original. So, if you could talk about, I'm kind of interested about what your comments about the original. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, about about the first question, uh, uh, it both things happen. I mean, uh, sometimes the original is irrelevant and is uh, uh, sometimes even it is even unknown uh, to the author of the meme. And that is the most frequent occurrence, but also what you were saying happens. I mean, sometimes the opposite is true. Sometimes you have to know the reference. You have to know the original image and the original significance to understand the twist of the meaning. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. These two uh, mechanisms are uh, all, both present in the world of memes. Sometimes it's, but maybe, um, uh, what was more uh, important about uh, the quote by Guy Debord is the fact that uh, um, the idea of being disrespectful, I mean, not having some sort of uh, reverential attitude towards images, maybe uh, maybe this is even more important that, that, this, that the idea of irrelevant uh, in itself. So maybe the, the, what we see here is the fact that uh, especially when we see art images that are used, they are not treated with any kind of special respect. Uh, and they, they are, art is, has been completely desacralized, desacralized, sorry. And so I think that this is maybe more important than the idea of the irrelevance, is the idea of not having a particular respect. It's indifference maybe more than, than irrelevance. Yeah. So this is for the first part of the question. Uh, for the second part about NFTs, um, of course, this is a very complex uh, uh, situation, but uh, I also uh, get these questions from my students and I also um, um, read uh, um, a lot of articles where they made this reference to Benjamin. What I normally suggest to my students is to actually read that text because it is one of the most uh, uh, misinterpreted texts. Uh, it, it's very well known, but it's, it's, I, th I, I feel that people, uh, that most people, of course, not, not everyone, but most people haven't read the whole thing. And it's very important because it's a very complex text in, in which the, the concept of the aura is not only about originality. Uh, for Benjamin, the, the aura is about a, some sort of magic property of the object, that it's not a, only about the fact that the, it's the original. It's about the fact that the, that object is unique and it's uh, um, displayed in a specific place. Uh, he says, hic et nunc, which is Latin, so here and now. And so the aura is about the fact that in the, in the past, you had to go to a specific place uh, to experience that specific object that was unique. And, and, and it was also about the place, about the history, about the, 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 the material of the object. It, there's a lot of, of uh, things that you have to take in consideration to define this uh, concept of the aura. And while well now, when, we, when I see this thing uh, that is mentioned in articles about NFTs and, and, and digital scarcity and so on, it is used as a synonym, synonym for uh, original, which, which is not a, exactly the same concept. So uh, what NFT, uh, NFTs do is to, uh, I mean, they are um, certificates. They are certificates of authenticity that are uh, that function in relation to a particular uh, technological system, which is the blockchain. But I mean, if, if we reduce to the to the core, uh, the, the the they are certificates of authenticity, which is not the same of originality. So they they just are there to certify that that particular thing is yours, which is of course it's a little bit uh, strange, and we could open a giant discussion about this. Uh, it's very strange if we apply the, the concept, the, 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 a certificate of authenticity to a digital file, because we know the digital files are reproducible. So this is the, the, the thing. But, but also, if you think about it, if you think about um, um, contemporary art history, uh, in, in, the, in the course of, uh, of time, uh, especially, in the 20th century, 
contemporary art has produced a lot of, of artworks that are not objects. So, so in, in, the, in the recent history of contemporary art, we have seen performances, we have seen uh, conceptual art, we have seen a lot of things that are actually not really objects that you can sell in a proper way, like a painting or a drawing. And, but, but that didn't stop the art market to sell that thing. So, for example, one, of, one very famous contemporary artist, uh, his name is Tino Siegel, he uh, exclusively makes performances and he doesn't uh, make any kind, he doesn't allow uh, any kind of documentation. So no photographs, no, and no videos, nothing. So if, at the end of the day, he doesn't have any object to sell. But the art market found a way to sell that thing anyway. So when he has to, to, to sell uh, the artwork, uh, he goes to, uh, um, how do you say, notario? <laughs> notary. notary. Yeah, you go to a notary and they just drop the document and they shake hands and the performance is yours. So I, I was making this example to say that it, it seems strange to us that NFTs uh, are certificates for digital files that we tend to associate with things that are reproducible and uh, immaterial, not objects. But the art market, I mean, did these kind of things for a long time. So it's, but of course it's very complex. We could think, talk about this for a long time. Maybe a question from the students. Thank you. Excuse me, just a second. Can you tell me your presentation talking about the things that we can do with the Okay, in that, in that part of the lecture, I was mm, talking about not just memes in the very narrow sense of the world. I was, uh, word, sorry, I was uh, uh, referring to uh, more generally to the world of uh, internet content, of the world of also viral images. So these images that we consume every day online. So digital images that are circulated uh, via a network. So that was the, 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 the context. And so what I was uh, trying to say is that the fact that images are so malleable, so easy, changeable, and the fact that we are um, becoming um, accustomed to this uh, uh, habit of downloading things and changing images, it's uh, opening up a new scenario that from one point of view, it's exciting because there's a lot of creativity going on. And, and also, it's also interesting that people not just uh, watch pictures, but they use it. They appropriate things and, 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 and use these images to express feelings, ideas, and so on. That, that's interesting and, and, uh, and probably a positive thing. But at the same time, we experience the world mostly through the screen, mostly through images that are digital that we see online. And so this uh, idea of being surrounded by images that are often manipulated and photoshopped and, and, and changed can be dangerous for our perception of reality. And, and, and I, I think that, I think that we, we see examples of these kind of things happening all the time. And in the specific case of memes, so when the image is not just manipulated, I mean, for the sake of, for, for fun or so on, when it's manipulated sometimes for uh, political reasons, it can be even more dangerous because you can uh, spread messages in a very strong way, and, uh, but these messages can be dangerous. But memes are very powerful. They, they, they interact in a, on a very uh, profound way with our beliefs and, and so, yeah. So I think that, that from, Seen from a point from um, 
certain point of view, it's, it is an exciting world. And we, I mean, we all love memes, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, we also see that it's, that sometimes it can get dangerous. So I don't know if I answer, but this is, I don't know if I answered the question. Yes, I wanted to like to my question or maybe I can uh, ask another line of discussion. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I, again, in connection to this kind of potential danger of uh, of uh, this side of things, uh, and it was an interesting passage in, in your lecture uh, about the uh, availability of the network. Uh, and on one hand, I think it's, it's interesting because I, mean, I, I always look at you uh, political issues, but uh, uh, many scholars, again, were recognizing the network to be uh, the main expression of the neoliberal logic. Uh, and uh, you were also talking about the, the fact that the image has become a way to, um, in some way, uh, let subjects. Uh, uh, for, for, for their activities, for mm -hmm. activities. So, yeah. I thought one of the main advantages would be when you reflect on this precisely uh, within this kind of possibility that's offered by uh, the digital image, uh, uh, with a kind of fire paradigm, which we are all against uh, all kinds of individuals, uh, uh, we all tend to accept uh, represent ourselves, to see ourselves with the technologies around us. Um, but yeah. Like more than worse, we need to comment if you want to expand it into that and the political side. Because again, to me, and to many commentators, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I didn't touch the political side at all, but that's a whole <laughs> different discussion. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. but uh, of course, really important too. But I, I, I didn't want, I didn't. Do you, do you want to comment? No, <laughs> no, 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 not now. I mean, not, not, not right now. Okay, so let's see if we have questions from the from the crowd from the from Zoom. Okay, let's read this question. Okay, by Natalia. Would you say that the digital circulation of images mm -hmm. and memes uh, has a potential to prove that the often implied intrinsic uh, Relation of photography to reality is at least questionable. So, relation to image should be more careful uh -huh. and critical. Uh -huh. It's seems that with the knowledge of our views, the meaning of image can be, uh -huh. for instance, that is under meme being used in political left, uh -huh. right, or political context. Nobody says scenario, so we should be more careful or sensitive to image, the image that we encounter. Okay, so now there's one question about again your self defense in front of images, also. Mm -hmm. If I've had a chance to read your book, it's a brilliant call. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you for the comment and also for uh, and also for the comment on the book. <laughs> um, okay, so let me so basically you're asking if we have to, if we should be more careful. Yes, of course, we should be more careful, and uh, of course. Um, as it happens with any com complex uh, situation, complex environment, uh, we uh, what really can help us is awareness of what's going on. So the more you uh, get to know the mechanisms, the more you get to know uh, how images are used, the more you get into the language of memetics and the more you can hope I mean, you can get a hope to, uh, to 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 be a little bit safer but nobody's safe in that kind of context you can be you we are all at risks of being uh, not only uh, deceived in the sense that we can of course uh, receive uh, uh, images that are that have been uh, manipulated for different purposes, but also because we are subjected, especially younger people, to uh, 
messages that sometimes we are not able to understand immediately when we receive them and so uh, act critically uh, towards them because sometimes some kind of messages can take forms that we don't recognize so basically what i'm saying is that the, the, the situation is really chaotic and really um, unprecedented for many point of view and so nobody is safe in this kind of environment i mean yeah we should try to we should try to be critical always uh, i mean as, as a way of life uh, but this is an environment that um, uh, we cannot consider safe in, in, i think in any way we are continually subjected to and and also sometimes um, I tend to think that we also have a biological issue in the sense that we are not equipped to process all these information. I mean, like biologically, maybe we are just not uh, made for that. We are not meant to see so many images and to uh, consume so many content. Maybe that is also a biological limit that we have. I don't know, I, I, I say this with a question mark because it's something that I think about sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. And again, it's a lot of good questions you may see. And like, and if you have any more questions, we can uh, and, and hear the, the lecture, you know, it's a reality. Again, you can scroll you over culture, inside of all these images, uh, the way in which they impact or uh, they dance. Okay, so thank you, everyone, especially. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I hope to see you all at the next event. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.